Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, wherever you're watching from, whether you're watching us live today or you're listening later to the podcast or watching the video on demand. So we're so glad that everyone's here today. We've got a fantastic guest. We've, you know, we're so lucky and blessed here on the Visual Lounge to talk to some amazing creators about creating video, about creating images. We hope that you're becoming one of those people yourselves, learning how to make better videos, making better images, to communicate better, to train people better. It's all good stuff. But today, let's let's get to today because it is fantastic. We've got a creator that I admire and is someone I turn to when I'm asking questions about creating video. In fact, some of my video setup today is, I got to this point because I watched his videos and said, if it's good enough for Sean, it's good enough for me, and I'm gonna follow in his footsteps. So, let me go ahead and introduce today's guest. He's got a great picture too, doesn't he? Sean Cannell is the CEO of Think Media and the host of Think Media Podcast. He is one of today's leading online video experts and the world's most watched YouTube strategists. He has been on, been featured on Forbes.com, CNBC, Social Media Examiner, Entrepreneur.com, and Success.com. After growing a six-figure income as a tech YouTuber, he built a multi-million dollar online video education company that he still runs today. Sean is also an international speaker, coach, and prolific content creator. His mission is to help 10,000 purpose-driven people create a full-time living while making a difference in the world with YouTube. He lives in Las Vegas with his wife, Sonia, his son, Sean Bradley, and his chihuahua, Sophie. And now he is here with us, and I want to welcome Sean Cannell to the Visual Lounge. Hey, Sean! Matt, good to see you, man. So pumped to be hanging out with you today, and thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, we are we are super excited. And Sean, like I have been watching your stuff. We actually got a chance to meet back in 2018 at Video Marketing World, and I've been watching your stuff since then and just learning. But my guess is there's people in our audience, they haven't had a chance to get introduced to you. So it's a fantastic bio, but what else before we jump into questions should we know about you? Yeah, I mean, it is kind of crazy because today um, uh, we have kind of like two offices. I mean, we work from home, but based in Vegas and Seattle, a team of 18 people working at Think Media, wrote a book called YouTube Secrets, number one best-selling YouTube strategy book in the world with my friend Benji. And um, and yeah, over 2 million subscribers across about four different YouTube channels, silver play buttons, gold play buttons that YouTube sends you when you hit milestones. Uh, but I say all that, and it's just kind of crazy to be here because I'm just a small town kid, college dropout, and I just started shooting videos in my bedroom. And so I'm just kind of a product of seeing that YouTube can change your life. It's not that it's easy. It's not that it's not an uphill battle. But if you've got the right strategies, a lot of tenacity, perseverance, um, this is this is a real thing. And even more so in 2021 and 2022, because um, Signal Fire revealed this is the fastest growing small business type being a content creator. This next decade is going to be the best decade on YouTube. A new report came out from um, YouTube showing that the YouTube economy is responsible for hundreds of thousands of jobs, the equivalent, whether that's people working in the YouTube uh, economy, building software companies, actually being content creators themselves. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And so um, I've just been on that journey and uh, and excited to now be, besides uh, what people I think need to know is today I'm really a, a teacher, but our value at Think Media is that we're player coaches. We just don't want to be people who teach on how to be successful on YouTube and got successful on YouTube by teaching how to be successful on YouTube. And that unf unfortunately happens too much in too many industries. But uh, originally, uh, and still am today, I was a tech YouTuber talking about tech, talking about cameras, talking about video, and built a six-figure income through affiliate marketing and talking about tech. Um, because I've been doing video since 2003 for my local church. And so I just spent a lot of time on cameras, video editing software, making some really bad videos setting having wrong frame rate settings between my original canon hv30 that i set at 24 frames and uh, or or rather and then i opened up uh my video editing software and i set it to pal because it sounded pal sounded more friendly i didn't know what ntsc was but pal <laughs> sounded more friendly i didn't know what they, i didn't know information like you help people with and so i just selected pal so then when i put this you know american footage into the video editing software it was all janky. I don't know what I was doing. And so <laughs> after doing video and editing and all this stuff and making so many mistakes over the years, 
I uh, really, um, you know, now pass along that information, help others with the tech side of things, as well as the YouTube strategy side of things. Yeah, I, I love what you said that you're a player coach, and I, I can definitely see that. And I feel that coaching come from me when I watch your videos, you know, when I was deciding on which camera to use for stream setup and things like that. I, I knew that you were in it, right? It wasn't just you were like, well, this is a great camera. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have any idea. Like, I knew you had used it. You were you had great quality. You, you'd gone through the the rigmarole. So let me ask you this, Sean, because like you said, you started in your bedroom and I actually, in one of our presentations I do, I go speak to people who are learning development folks, right? They're not, they're not on YouTube, that pejorative term we sometimes throw around, YouTubers. Uh, I go talk to people and I actually use you as an example and I show, uh, much probably to your chagrin, I show a very early clip of you uh, in your video and I, then I show stuff from t like now to show the progression because I think it's really important that people see that like, you know, and then I mentioned like, hey, this is not an overnight success. But the, the thing that I wanna know is along that progression, there must have been a point where you're like, oh my gosh, we've moved from, I'm doing this because I love it and it's fun or, you know, like to like, we're gonna build a, a actual business around this. An 18, did you say eight or 18 people? 18 and about 18. to hire about eight. We're like hiring right now. So we're, oh, we'll be at 30 soon. Crazy, right? Like, so what, what was that tipping point for you? Like when you say, like, oh my gosh, we can really, I can really do this and this can be, you know, what, what I do. I don't have to do these other things. Yeah. I mean, I think there was tipping points along the way. Uh, you know, what's interesting is I, I think for, for all of us, it does start with a vision, you know, uh, as the, you know, ancient verse says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I think having a vision of, of what could be, uh, a vision of seeing opportunity down the road. It might be foggy, but man, a vision is so powerful. It keeps you motivated. And so I like to ask people, and I think even, even listening to this, you know, what's your vision for the future? What could you create? How far could you go? Um, what could this look like in the future? You know, back in 2010, I, I'm in a small town. And the truth is, Matt, that sometimes, you know, your small town can actually kind of make you small minded, you know? not a bad thing. Your small business can kind of make you small minded. You can only kind of see as far as you can see. It's hard to dream beyond maybe the environment that you're in. Um, and so that's why I say it was tipping points. I mean, one of the first tipping points was the first time I ever earned some money through affiliate marketing, because I would talk about products on Amazon, link them up, you know, put them in videos. I made a lot of mistakes and I wasn't even doing it right. And the links were broken. And that was one reason why money didn't come in for a while. And then I was like, oh, I actually need to set this up right. But I'll never forget when I got my first check from Amazon, from the associates program, and it was November, 2010, and it was for $2 and 12 cents. That's right. I was able to buy one third, pay for one third of my wife's peppermint, venti peppermint mocha with an extra shot from Starbucks with that money. And so it really didn't change our financial life, but honestly it did because it wasn't really just a financial barrier that was broken that day. It was a mind barrier. I was like, I just made $2 and 12 cents more than my neighbors made online today. Like this is real. <laughs> and it was like a yeah. proof of concept moment. And it had me dream a little bit bigger. Like, wow. I, and, and this happened, even though I made the video, this happened while I was waiting tables at my day job. Like the money just came in because someone was watching the video when I wasn't working. So all of a sudden I was like, well, what if $2 could become $20, 200, 2000, maybe 20,000. You know, if people are new to, to my story, you can actually Google CNBC did a, uh, a little 10 minute mini documentary on this guy that just started shooting videos in his bedroom and built it in and had a $40,000 profit month from the Amazon associate program. So I think it's like, you got to dream big, but you start small. And, and you got to dream big, but sometimes if you're just a dreamer and not a doer, then, then the dream is just pie in the sky. And so I just right. kept taking action and I just kept taking action and hitting new milestones. First, tried to get it to viability of a little bit of extra income online. Then as a solopreneur, my wife has always been doing the books for us and I was just doing everything else, the YouTube thumbnails, editing, shooting, you know, uh, promotion, titles. YouTube descriptions, social media, doing it all. I mean, a lot of people can relate when they start creating content or creating content as a side hustle. 
And, and then eventually we were, we made our full time income. And then it was like, well, can we make more than that? And then it was like, can we hire help? And, and I think it, I always was, I think I had a big vision, but I was also anchored in practicality. And so as we've even reached where we all are today on our way to like an eight fig a year company, it's all, we're dreaming even bigger now. And I actually have to dream bigger. Like I have to actually, especially if, if you want to be intelligent with taxes, like some things like you're not spending enough money. We still work from home. We still work from like our, we're, we're a multimillion dollar media company, which I think is cool, but we've been entertaining commercial space. We've been entertaining things like, I, you know, I was the main guy doing thumbnails until six months ago, until we hired Ian. Now we have a full-time graphic designer. I was the full-time graphic designer, happy to do it, but seeing bigger, like, okay, now it's more about leadership. It's more about uh, moving into being a CEO. And Matt, what the heck do I know about C being a CEO? I was just a video producer shooting videos in my bedroom. So I think the other piece has been a relentless commitment to dream bigger, stay practical, but also add new skills, a commitment to skill building and personal growth, because what worked today, I really don't believe will work tomorrow. If you want to go to the next level, what helped us get here won't help you get there. It's one thing to reach six figures as an entrepreneur, but it a lot stays stuck and it can't reach seven because it's a whole different operating system. It's almost like, you know, Windows seven's a little too old. We need to actually get, get to Windows 10. I don't even know, you know, uh, or, or whatever, Android, uh, Safari, Apple, Cheetah. Uh, but like, you got to upgrade your operating system, upgrade to a new level. And so I've continuously just felt stretched. And I look at what we're doing today and it's absolutely blown my mind, but we start, we're dreaming even bigger, multiple channels, multiple content creators. Um, and I know I've talked a long time here, but the final thing I'll say that's interesting is Matt Pat recently did a session at Vid Summit, which is Daryl Eve's event. And he actually talked about the evolution of of uh, YouTube creators. And it was kind of like there's those early days where it's really entertaining, kind of funny type of creators. And they were just sort of figuring things out. Some of them have disappeared. And then it went through different eras of YouTube. And it actually talked about that the YouTube creator of today is uh that has been around is beating is building the next generation of media companies mm -hmm. and uh susan from the ceo of youtube s said the same thing so i think for some it's about self-awareness like not that every single creator needs to like build a media company at, at scale but i think that's what's been exciting is it's just been a wild journey of of like all right now that we've actually reached a, kind of a new mountaintop we rest a little we we figure out what's kind of happening here. And then we think about how can we go to the next level and how can we get more people involved, you know, support families, impact more people, extend the reach. It's, it's been, it's been a wild ride. Yeah. Well, that, that is an awesome journey. And one of the things I often like to say, particularly in relationship, and I think of you and a few others that I talked to at Video Marketing World that one time is that, you know, people have that. I, and I mentioned the pejorative YouTuber, like, oh, you're a YouTuber. Or, Kids want to be a YouTuber, right? And and I, I get it. They want some fame. They want they want maybe some perceived revenue or income from that. But I think the thing I always I like to lead with is that what I'm seeing is folks like yourself are smart business people or becoming smart business people over like first being, you know, like just a YouTuber, right? And I think that's really important because one of the things I want to make sure we're talking about here and putting context for my audience is. You know, you're talking about building business. Some of the folks that are probably like, I just want to know how to make a better video, right? And that's important. But I love what you're saying, that progression. Progression is really important, whether you're learning to make a better training video, a better, you know, you know, whatever video you're making for, you know, instead of a meeting, you're doing a video. And so I think I love this idea that it's a journey. And wherever you were 10 years ago or in 2010 or in your basement, you know, or in your, in your bedroom making videos isn't where you need to end up. And you just got to keep going down that journey. So, uh, next question for you though, Sean, when we talked, uh, several years ago, one of my favorite quotes to come out of that entire two day process of do going through interviews is you said, uh, punch perfectionism in the face, you know, punch perfection in the face. And I love that. It's a great line. And it's one that I get to, I get to quote you often. Um, but it's really hard, especially in organization, like in business, right? Because I look at your quality of camera and I look at your quality of videos you know, you've got a team that's now doing your thumbnail, so you don't have to do it. And it's really hard to be like, well, gosh, does Sean really believe that? Because 
I think so often it's we get caught up in what we see in other people. But so what advice would you give to the folks out there, particularly in those corporate environments who are saying, well, I can't afford to not show somebody my very perfect thing. You know, uh, how, how do you get work through that? What's the balance? Mm. Well, I also I think perfectionism is a is a is evil perfection because because perfectionism is a moving target. Um, it's subjective. And so the reason it's evil is because it's disempowering. Um, what there's a difference between perfectionism and excellence. Um, I believe that excellence is doing the best you can with what you have right now. And I actually believe that, you know, behind every principle, there's a promise and that the promise of being connected to excellence is that when you do your best with what you have today, I believe it'll unlock greater possibilities for a brighter tomorrow. Um, and that would be my personal journey over the last 10 years. I agree with you. If I say, Hey, punch perfectionism in the face. And you're like, what are you talking about, dude? You're shooting in 4k with a $3,000 camera and a $3,000 lens and, and, you know, incredible lighting. And, and there's a set and a studio and you have four people helping you. And you've worked on your communication skills for over 15 years. What do you, you know, easy for you to say, well, not easy for me to say it's 15 years of trying to just do my best with what I have every single day. And by getting 1% better and being focusing more on excellence than perfectionism. Um, I heard George Lucas is famous for having a quote, you know, the director of star Wars that said, no movie is ever finished. It's only abandoned. <laughs> so, the thing with perfectionism as well is perfectionism will hold you back from ever actually publishing. Nothing is ever perfect. So at some point you have to commit to the ethic done is better than perfect and, and thus per per punch perfectionism in the face. So for the professional to make some of this practical, I think excellence is a great commitment to have and and that could be excellence in your dress, ex excellence in, in what you're presenting on camera, thoughtfulness in regards to your background or where you're shooting the video and maybe thoughtfulness in terms of, you know, even if you just prop your cell phone up on the, on a desk in your office, um, and deliver some content, I think that's great. People can understand it's about the content value, not the production value. Excellence is just deciding to do that and shoot that video there instead of at the train station. Because even if you don't have a mic, if you shoot at a train station, it doesn't matter what mic you have, it's a little too loud. Like, so mm -hmm. if you're just thoughtful, like think about just having decent audio, don't even accessorize, like just use your smartphones are amazing. Go in a quiet room, open up a window, put your camera down and realize that it's about the value you're delivering to the person on the other side. And then have this commitment to, you know, really leveling up, um, as as you go and 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 then the one other thing to just completely eviscerate perfectionism is i just think that social media has proven um professional business b2b content has proven on youtube on linkedin video on TikTok, which is definitely younger and maybe less professional but especially linkedin it's proven that perfectionism is not needed for success that you see a ton of iPhone content or not the best lit content or not even the greatest audio content that's performing incredibly well, that's delivering some kind of education or inspiration or entertainment or something relatable of office culture or, or, or webcam video with screen share that's delivering a deck or training through something. Um, and if the value is there, if you make a, a promise in the title of the video um, and you deliver on that promise, the quality of your, your webcam or your lighting is not what people are into. They want to know, I want to see the latest findings or stats from your industry. If you, and if you're brief, be brief, be bright, be fun and be done. Like just hit record and, and put that stuff out there. Of course, I think, uh, the ethic of excellence is that we can just start with our laptop webcam and, and screen share a, a keynote presentation. But of course, as revenues coming in or as our larger business or a corporation commits to excellence, 
we also then are consistently leveling up and improving uh, and improving. One of our words we talk about a lot at Think Media for our team is is the concept of Kaizen, the Japanese um, uh, word that is also a philosophy of Japanese business, which is the philosophy of continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. It's actually just nonstop improvement in business and communication in the quality of the product. It's just nonstop refining of the, I mean, TechSmith knows this. It's like, that's why there's version 1.0 and then an update's rolled out 1.002, you know, and then finally yeah. 2.00, like, because, because we, we all need to just kind of be constantly improving. So punch perfectionism in the face is, is my attempt to say, stop making excuses, stop overthinking it, stop waiting until you have the perfect camera, stop waiting until you feel super confident or completely confident on camera and literally just press record and start creating content and then don't stop. Because if you're gonna be where you need to be in the digital economy and YouTube and social video in the next three years, you're not gonna be there three years from now if you actually don't start practicing today putting some of your worst videos out today so you can get to your best videos, putting out some of your learning videos so you can get to the videos that are better. And you mentioned playing my first video, that's the progression. Like I literally just pressed record on a webcam, just, you know, declared I wasn't gonna be energetic or entertaining, had super low energy and, and I just started there, but then I just committed to not perfection, but to a commitment to excellence and getting 1% better with every upload. Yeah, I, I, I love it. And it, it, what was it? Uh, be brief, be, uh, be bright. bright, be brief, be fun, be done. be fun, be done. I love it. I love it. And we're big fans of the idea of leveling up uh, every single day, just making those videos better and better. I want to I wanna jump to a couple of questions that have come in from our audience, Sean, just because they've got some good questions. First one real quick. Uh, we don't need to spend a long, t long time on this. Just a question. Someone's asking about your microphone. It's a sweet look. They're like, it's a sweet looking microphone. We love gear yeah, here. We're, sure, we're gearheads. Sure. MV 51. And it has that kind of classic, you know, of course, style. And uh, that's the model number. And just on like a road boom arm. And and then I I, I do a lot of plosive because plosives because I speak passionately. So I actually have this pop filter in front of it as well. Yeah. Awesome. So our, our next question from our audience comes from Christy. He's asking, uh, surely Sean, you've tried a lot of different things. You got to see what's going to work. What was the moment you realized that your niche, what your niche was and went all in and how'd you get to that realization? So that's, uh, you know, this is actually a question I have later on is I was going to ask you about, but niches, right? Like, uh, it seems like if you're going to be on YouTube, there's a lot of reasons maybe to niche down your, your message, right? You can't be about cars and basketball and 12 other things to be successful. You got to kind of pick one, right? At least that would, that's my take. I'd love to hear from you on that. So how did you come to the realization of what your niche was? Yeah. So this is a great question because actually picking the right niche is critical. It's the foundation of everything. Um, the tallest skyscrapers have the deepest foundations. The largest trees have the deepest set of roots. Like, what are you building on? And in some cases, this is a business principle, but um, you do market research and there's what's known as the TAM. It's the total addressable market. If you, if you have large ambitions to reach like a large market, but there isn't even a large market, well then you're, your initiative is doomed from the start, depending on what your end goal is. But I think it really starts with like, what is your end goal? Because what YouTube has proven though, is it is a little bit different than say building an online business or building a direct to consumer company or something, because um, YouTube is a place where you can turn your passion into profit. And so if your ambition is to say, quit your 50K per year earning job, and be able to earn that 50K online, it's stunning how your passion for collectible figurines might actually be sustainable, where talking about some kind of a niche, um, you know, cartoon or classic films or something else wouldn't really be a business model in the past that actually is very much a business model on YouTube. But let me give you some handles for niche. First of all, how did I find it? First, I just started posting videos and um, I had no idea what I was doing. So I actually started with experiments. For those who don't have a really clear idea on what their niche is, you can see a lot of these on my channel, Sean Cannell. 
Um, and I, I did cooking videos and I did a review of the amazing Spider-Man and I did vlogs with my wife for 45 days every day, which, uh, and then I did gift ideas, videos, and I did all kinds of stuff, but what it ended up being was a massive education. It was also helped me create content faster. It helped me create content with more speed and why none of that actually turned into, I don't in its current form, it could, there's no way it could have scaled into what think media is today. Um, I've learned that you can't steer a parked car. And so there's something about, I was taking action. I was going, I learned a lot of things that kind of didn't work or sort of worked. And it then actually led me to clarity. And eventually there was an aha moment of, wow, my superpower or the thing that works best for me and what, what people want most from me is, is tech and cameras. And I discovered a framework where actually the best niche on YouTube for you is at the intersection of your passion, your proficiency, and also something that's profitable. So again, if you don't care about profitable and you want to do a hobby, well, then you don't need all three P's, but I was passionate about cameras and about creating content. I've been doing it since 2003 before YouTube started. I was also good at it because I'd been doing it since 2003 and I was obsessed with learning and leveling up. And then there was also ways to monetize. Oh, I can talk about cameras and tech and I can do affiliate links with them. There's a lot more ways than that, but it was the initial way. So I was like, okay, so there's a lot of directions I could go, but it was at the intersection of those three P's, your passion, your proficiency and your profit. So then I doubled down and Part of that revelation was on the other side. I actually have like six YouTube channels now and four of them are failures. But I really believe that sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. So they weren't really failures. They were experiments that helped me get greater clarity because maybe as clear as it sounds now, this is a journey of pain, friends. This was a journey of, of like, I don't really know. And maybe it even seems obvious. I look back and I'm like, why didn't I see that sooner? Well, sometimes uncovering that self-awareness, market awareness, the intersection of not just our passions, not just our proficiency, but also what's profitable. And then what I would encourage people is like, work on that right now. What you do is you write down, um, you're looking for thematic overlap. You write down 10 passions that you could think about turning your YouTube channel into. You then say, okay, what out of those 10 passions, what am I also best at? And maybe you, you get people you can trust, not your mom if she typically fl flatter, flatters you, but it's somebody who actually will just give you honest feedback will be like, you're not as good at guitar as you thought. So I'd, cr I'd crush guitar, you know, cross guitar out. But I don't know, you are like, you're really good at crypto. Like you're, you love it, you research it, it fascinates you. Um, you read all about it, you've invested in it, you've played in it, you've had some wins. Crypto is a strength. It's not just a passion of yours. It's also like a proficiency of yours. And then can crypto be, you know, a channel about crypto investing or something be profitable? Are you kidding? It's probably one of the biggest waves, anything in personal finance. So, so if you wrote down 10 ideas and limited down to like four in the proficiency and then in profitable, you might say, which one's most profitable or at that point you just pick one. And that is if you're going to be a business minded content creator where some people get tripped out by this. They're like, yeah, why does it have to be about business and money? It doesn't. It just, if you actually want to make money, and you want to actually have money for the mission and be able to fund your passion and scale this thing and have it be sustainable and even do it full time, you better figure out the business viability of it. And that would actually be, be doing your due diligence in the profitable category, thinking about market size, thinking about is it a growing market or is it a shrinking market? Thinking about the purchasing power of that audience. What's the CPMs of that audience? Um, that age demographic, all different things that you could do if you really drill down on research. If you go through that framework, that'll lead you to potentially um, that your personal power uh, when it comes to picking a niche on YouTube. Well, I love that because I'm making all these comparisons because as a someone who's on YouTube, obviously, as we're, we're streaming live right now, right? Like I'm doing it for a business and the business is doing a lot of this work about thinking about the audience, thinking about the niche that we have. You know, we're a software company that makes screen recording products. So where are we going to fit in and how are we going to do this? So, you know, I, I, I think it would be really easy if, if anyone's listening to this and thinking, well, that doesn't apply to me because I work in a, I'm doing this for a company. I think it's a, the, the same thing. Like, and, and that passion gets conveyed from hopefully the organization, like you should be, pa hopefully you're passionate about the products that you make as, you know, at TechSmith, we're known to be passionate a little bit just a little bit about Camtasia and Snagit and the, the things that they bring. So uh, really, really great advice, Sean. Uh, one of the follow-up question that came along with this one was 
the question is, how do you stay motivated when things uh, grew or growing too slowly? So I would imagine in your journey here, as you're figuring out like this one, this channel's not, this isn't going to work, or this one's going to, this one seems to be doing better. It's hard to be patient. And I, I think this is true for a lot of video creators because also, even if we look at the journey of the 10, you know, from 2010 on or wherever we started, it's hard to be patient. Like I want to be where Sean is, and I, but I haven't put in the reps yet. So what's your advice to, to people out there who like are just anxious, but they're, they need to be a little bit more patient. What do they do? What should they do? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a good personal question. You know, how do you stay motivated? Um, you know, interestingly enough, think media is 11 years old. Um, and 2010 to 2015, I grew about 16,000 subscribers. And then from 2015 to 2022, we'll be at 2 million, 16,000 in the first five years. And, and basically 2 million in this, and like essentially in the, in the next six, six years. So when it comes to staying motivated, I think what happens for a lot of us is a lot of us overestimate what we can accomplish in one year, but we underestimate what we can accomplish in five to 10 years. And I think it's having a stick to it a I will until mentality that if you have that inner confidence and faith that the idea is strong, if you have the confidence and self belief, um, you know, what I believe confidence is, is not, uh, I, I, my, my belief on confidence is that, um, it is a self belief that I can figure things out. So if you not only start and say, well, I see my skill gaps, but I also, I think I can figure it out. Like we're living in the information age. I can learn this. I can study this. There's probably a YouTube video on this. There's probably a course on this. And if, if you have that confidence that I'm going to commit to learning, I'm going to commit to keep growing and I'm going to have way more of a vision on what's possible in five to 10 years and, and way less of a vision in what is, is maybe even possible in one year year. I've had the privilege now of interviewing over 200 successful entrepreneurs and YouTube entrepreneurs and content creators. And it's similar story. A lot of people were not getting quick success. It was a lot of times after year two, year three, year four. And by the way, if you make that one commitment, you will outpace 99% of the competition. Steve Jobs was famous for saying that he said, business is mostly a game of attrition. Just meaning if you just can keep standing longer than everybody else, you let the years pass and the economics ups and downs pass and you and and all kinds of different things happen And over enough time, your competitors are just going to disappear. They're going to get tired. They're going to make bad financial decisions. Life stuff's going to hit them. So if all you can do is just keep standing and just have the fortitude to keep standing, keep putting one foot in front of the other and have a way more be way more anchored into that long term vision than that short term vision. That's going to be uh, absolutely uh, major, and so uh, those are a couple of things to stay motivated. And then, and then the deeply personal part, I think, for me, is is certainly my faith. Like, um, you know, there's a good book that's it's not a faith based book called The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. And and during one of the hard seasons of my life, I'm trying to grow my YouTube channel. I've got a full time job. That full time job's not going very well. My marriage was probably the worst. We might, we've been married 16 years. We're in the worst season of our marriage by far. Uh, I'm feeling like I'm failing in every area. I'm waking up every day, um, discouraged, overwhelmed. You know, I'm drinking too much uh, the the night before, which is not making me feel good in the morning. I'm in a really bad cycle. I'm still, you know, showing up and trying to get through things. But I remember I read this book called The Miracle Morning that was like, if you win the day, you got to win the morning, and then you can actually win the day. And it, and, it, and it got me back. It got me back on track to just being committed to get up each morning when you're losing. Get up every each morning when your YouTube channel is not really growing. To get up every morning when everything around you is also going wrong. How am I going to be inspiring and put quality content on YouTube when I've got life pressures and family pressures and, and even self-confidence, you know, insecurities and all this kind of stuff. And actually to realize that before you start seeing external results, it's about that internal work. And this is around 2015, and I've been on a climb since then where I got back to where I'm waking up. And for me, you know, I'm studying the Bible, I'm praying, 
I'm journaling, I'm walking or stretching, I'm hydrating, I'm starting to, and it, it's not an overnight transformation, but I've actually been committed to uh, what is others have called a prize fighter morning routine to realize that, you know, I, and this week I had some things going on where I woke up in like dread, you know, the, the famous um, poet and philosopher and prophet, the, no, the, the notorious B.I.G. said it this way, mo money, mo problems, you know? And so there's things where there was, there's some million dollar decisions we are making that were stressing me out. And I was getting out of bed, like waking up with weighty anxiety on me. And I had to come to this very desk, open up my Bible, open up my journal. And actually after about an hour's time, I'm coming out of that place. What's the purpose of a prize fighter morning routine to get into a place of uh, mental toughness, to get into a place of inner confidence, to get into a place of spiritual power, to get into a place of renewed vision, to get into a place of putting on the blinders of all the external things. You can't fight tomorrow's battles today. You know, all we have is today and all we got to do is get through today. And so that's a big one because there's no doubt about it, especially now, like the world is, is crazier than ever before. Depression and anxiety are up. Uh, inflation is going crazy. Inflation is outpacing wages, not to be doom and gloom. It's just a fact like uh, job satisfactions down, like, um, you know, the economic challenges, health challenges, people have lost loved ones. So I know this isn't about video editing, but this is the real stuff because the real stuff is, is having that fortitude to keep standing, to not quit and to just commit to keep learning. And, and that is what ends up happening. Again, how many people maybe started doing what I was doing 10 years ago and they just stopped? Mm -hmm. Like one of the reasons I could be where I am today is because I just didn't quit. And one of the ways I did not quit was I actually prioritized my inner health my inner game, realizing that I think things start from the inside and then they start showing up on the outside. Well, I, I love that because I think I, I agree with you. Those things that we do uh, inside make a huge difference to to what we're doing around us. And I think it makes a big difference. And it's a big part of leveling up, right? Like if you want to get better, it's it's not going to be, you know, I, I, I've talked about this in other places, but I started running this year. I'm not a runner. I've never been a runner. thought I hated running. Uh, and, you know, came come to find out actually I didn't hate it I just was really out of shape and really bad at it but every time I commit you know I now it's, it's gotten story. better so that was one of the habits I started in 2015 and it it changed my life one piece of a combination of habits and for if you're trying to build on YouTube you're an entrepreneur and entrepreneurs know this you're going to get punched in the face it's going to be super discouraging it is a roller coaster entrepreneurs have the highest highs and the lowest lows. One day you'll be on top of the world. My video got 10,000 views. The next day you're going to be staring depression right in the face being like, I'm an absolute failure. My best days are behind me. I'm not going to be able to do that again. One day you're going to get a big client or a big check or something. You're going to be like, we're doing it. And then one next day you're going to get a tax bill and be like, holy crap, I owe the IRS $148,000. True story at one point, a couple years back. And I was like, Oh, what? And, and, and you start learning about financial management and taxes and, and getting the right people on the team. And so, um, man, for entrepreneurs, that's definitely, you want to create a set of habits that support the insanity that is real entrepreneurship. And for YouTube creators, it doesn't have to be that intense. You might be like, dude, I'm just trying to make five hours a week to do a hobby and a side hustle. There's a whole path of opportunity on YouTube that doesn't have to be like, you know, the craziest of all, you know, levels of pressure and whatnot. But, you know, a lot of people want to do this. And so it, I'm, I'm definitely hope we never preach at Think Media like it's easy. I actually do think it can be simple if you work principles and stick with it. Um, but yeah, you definitely need some habits to uh, support the pressures of uh, what it takes to build your influence online and build an online business. Yeah. Love it. Love it. I want, I want to shift gears a little bit here, Sean, because, you know, I, like I mentioned, kind of top of the show that I, I've watched a lot of your content in terms of gear and that's where, you know, you found your niche and talking about cameras and things like that. So I'm really curious, what does your process look like when you're going to sit down and you're like, man, there's going to be a new camera or we want to explore something. You and your team, what does that look like? Kind of just high level start to finish. How do you decide what you talk about, what you, 
like, you know, we know good editing is a lot about cutting out crap, getting rid of the stuff that you don't need. Sounds like life too, right? Get rid of the stuff you don't need. Uh, but I'm curious, for you and your team, what, what generally, what does that flow look like? Where do you start and how do you get to the point where you've got a video that's gonna go out live on YouTube? Yeah, it's it's a it's a hard challenge, and this this speaks to like niching down, right? Because um, for us at Think Media, or just having a quote unquote tech channel, there's the tempa temptation to go in a million different directions. You know, I live in Vegas. I'm streaming from Vegas right now, and um, every year there's an event called CES. And when you actually see how big the world of tech is, how many new products there are, how many things to cover, it's shocking. It also shows me how much opportunity and growth there is for anybody that wants to start in this sector because it's just absolutely incredible. But problem is complexity is the enemy of execution. So I've learned you have to have guardrails. You have to have um, filters to figure out what do you talk about, what don't you talk about. So what we figured out partway in the Think Media journey was, okay, we're I mean, because I've reviewed monitors and I suppose they're somewhat relevant, maybe dual monitors, live streaming, but, you know, I've reviewed Bluetooth speakers or talked about that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and eventually I was like, no, okay, here's what Think Media is about. So it's also knowing what you're about and what you're not about. And it's, we're about tools for creators, period. Even more than that, we're about tools for your average everyday YouTube creator or aspiring YouTube creator. Therefore, it started to say, okay, we're not talking about 3D printers. We're not talking about Bluetooth speakers anymore. We're not talking about red cameras because that's not an everyday creator. Even a, 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 a videographer, that's still out of reach for most. Um, and so our sweet spot became really understanding who we were talking to and the, the specific person we wanted to help. It is my belief that the creator who understands the viewer best wins. So... We're talking to, and, and when we think about, okay, what cameras do we talk? Because there's so many cameras to talk about. It actually can be pretty easy these days with all of the knowledge base we've built to eliminate things down to say, okay, um, without even testing the camera yet. Like, cause that say, cause if we have to even test the camera, that could take a long time, you know, or, mm -hmm. or integrate it into our workflow, or I integrate it into a family trip or something so I could talk about it authentically or whatever. And so. We start thinking, well, what do YouTube creators need? Well, they need the flip screen. So it's like, if it doesn't have a flip screen, then then we're not going to talk about that. Um, if the autofocus is bad, unfortunately, kind of like knocks a lot of Panasonic cameras completely off. They're still contrast based to this day. And some people like defend it and they try to do it. And we're like, listen, we, we it's a filter. So we're mainly talking about Canon and Sony. Um, if if it actually is relevant, if the, pr the price range, like we will stretch into towards the upper 2000 range, because there's certainly a lot of business owners, entrepreneurs, and creators that would maybe spend that much on a Sony a7C, but we're probably not gonna talk about and have not talked about a Canon R5 because it's like a three $3,500 body or something like that. So it's, hel it's helped us narrow things down. There's a lot of really premium cinematic lighting equipment, but we stick with brands like GVM that are well-built, but also budget priced because they're kind of for the everyday creator. And so that's, that's really, I think, our sweet spot of um, figuring out what we're going to, uh, you know, integrate. And then our process is it also then limits, it, it limits down how many things we play or coach, how many things we actually, um, we get our hands on it, use it in some different situations, our team, uh, uh, some of them still have client work. So we get to, I don't do that anymore. But I was doing that. So our ethic was like, use it in, um, in a f commercial shoot, use it for event photography, use it. And then that is one of the reasons why we are who we are, because then we could really speak from it from an authoritative place. They have their own vlogs, they have their own channels, which becomes a cool, uh, you know, science lab for, for testing a limited number of cameras. So here's practical thought too, is GoPro is, is a good option for a lot of creators, only $400. $300 for like a model ago, you can get the media kit. So you do have the selfie screen. Um, it has, of course, limitations, but the the stabilization makes it great for vloggers. Um, the newest one has a, a selfie screen on it for YouTube creators, little mics, you could plug into it. So we ordered uh, Nolan and this helps us. And then and then the other key to get to more scale was more content creators. 
because I'm like, man, I, I know a, a lot about certain types of cameras, but Omar knows a lot more about Sony. But for instance, we sent Nolan a GoPro and the media mod and everything else, you know, from the company when him and his wife, Madeline, were going to go on vacation and uh, kind of cool because he loves filming and he's a kind of a filmmaker at heart. But then he is able to get the B-roll. He's able to get the stuff, clock a few hours while he's in Mexico. And then we've got that to integrate into a video. So we find ways to um, really narrow down what gear we're covering and then find ways to calendar it out. And, and then to this day, it's 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 we're like kids in candy shops, though. There's just too much. We have <laughs> unlimited video ideas, unlimited things to talk about, unlimited things we want to get to. So that's probably the final tip is this prioritization for anybody. I mean, this is YouTube and life and business, but it's really YouTube. Uh, every, if you're listening to this, you're probably a creative person and you probably would agree. Yeah, I have so many different ideas. Your two elements you need to start getting some stuff done is number one, prioritization, and then number two, concentration. So you have to first say, okay, I do have a hundred video ideas, but I which ones are most important? Which cameras or which tutorials or which software would be the most important. I need to prioritize these. Then you have to develop the skill of concentration. And that's not meant to sound condescending. I think we would probably all agree. Your iPhone is telling you, it tells you at the end of the week, it says your screen time this week was 10 and a half hours. Your screen time, you could drop it, you know, in the comments, like it's 20, who has the most 20 hours? You know what I mean? 15, <laughs> Ugh, like, okay, we have issues with concentration or we're trying to work on 48 different ideas at once. You need to get one done. So that's, we are fighting it's, it, and, and I'm not even saying we're winning the battle. We are just actively in the fight along with everybody else, understanding there's so many things to watch. There's so much to do. There's so many squirrels. There's so many sh shiny objects. These are superpowers in the new economy, prioritization, and then concentration in terms of, okay, now I'm going to put blinders on and eventually I got to let it go. Black Friday and Cyber Monday are coming up at the time of recording this, right? And it's like, Oh man, there's so much, but it's like, okay, I'd, I'd rather do well by just answering some specific questions rather than try to tackle this entire thing, because it's, there's just so many different ideas and ways this could go. And I don't want to dilute my impact by diluting my concentration. Yeah. I, I, I love this idea of, of narrowing and focusing and finding, finding the things that you're just eliminate the things you're not going to talk about. Um, you know, it, it, because it is a challenge. There's a million things. There's always something else we could talk about. So I think that's, I, I, I love this from, again, putting it to kind of our audience perspective. If you're thinking about creating training content, learning content, you're creating documentation content, whatever it might be. Again, what are the things that people really, really need? What is it that you're going to really focus on? Who's the audience you're going to really focus it on for? So we're going to get to our speed round questions, but before we do, I want to just share some, we, we do a, a research report every couple of years. It's the same report. We just renew it and then say like, what's changed in the data. A lot of times we got our, our report back. It's called the video viewer study for 2021. And I'm going to put up here on just a second, uh, a, a, one of the stats and just for context, about 900 people took this study is looking at people who are looking at, we asked them to you know, think about inf informational or instructional videos that are watching. So not entertainment, you know, not, not the Netflix and things like that, but instructional information videos. And those could be on YouTube or it could be on their work, in their work environment. You know, they're required to watch something. And this particular stat I'm gonna bring up is about length of video. And you make a lot of videos and I'm just curious about your opinions about lengths of video. So let me go ahead and bring this up here. We'll zoom in just a touch. So maybe see it a little bit better. So. Uh, the, the key stat, so this, how long do you prefer? This is all preference, so it's not like they were looking at what videos they watch, but just their gut feeling of preference for these informational instructional videos. What we saw is that 22% of the people said five to six minutes, 21 were at three to four, and then kind of an outlier, 19, 10 to 19 was also 22%. So any, any thoughts about this? Any thoughts from your experience about length of video? Because this is a question people always ask us. How long should my videos be? We've got lots of different answers we can give them, but I'm just curious what you think. I actually think that the study revealed the exact answer and it's right in front of our eyes right now. Um, all of them. <laughs> that's the end. <laughs> and that's yeah. what we've learned. So people are asking, they're asking for the magic video length. And, and I think um, the better way to look at it is that different video lengths serve different purposes. 
first of all, it's to the degree of understanding your audience. You know, it's it's powerful to potentially build a brand where um, you do uh, five minute news. The news is always in five minutes. You become no known for the headlines of the day in five minutes. It's a video podcast. It's a podcast. Well, then that's a strategic use of video length and branding. But for the average YouTube creator and think media being an example, that diagram is exactly what we do. We we're creating YouTube shorts. They're less than a minute. One just went viral. It got a million video views in a day, 2.6 million views total and grew our channel by 7,500 subscribers. So, oh, so it must be YouTube shorts, which are less than a minute. Okay. If you look at it from a myopic vantage point, sure. But no, it's like, so we do YouTube shorts. We also usually hover exactly as you showed between probably five to 20 minutes where the bulk of the respondents are. And then the next question is it's less about video length and it's less of, um, is, are you trimming the fluff? Is it just, is it necessary content? The video should be as long as it needs to be, but as short as possible. So no one's complaining that the Godfather trilogy is, is too long. The content is great and it's compelling and it holds your attention. You know, it, and so I think the issue with video length is what does the content itself ne ne necessitate? Furthermore, we have 55 minute training videos. We have two hour videos on Think Media. We have a final cut tutorial that is uh, two hours long. It is actually, it's a free course. It's not a tutorial. It's, it's a complete concept to completion and it's crushing. Why? Because people who want to sit down, they can start it, stop it, pause it, start it, stop it, watch it. Um, it's just, it's what necessity, it's how long it takes to learn that. And a, a good point to put it though, is, is, uh, Nolan on our team created that he's a great, he's a good teacher and he was still Matt. He was still brief. He mm -hmm. was still bright. He was still fun and he was still done. It just to be brief will take two hours for the, the, for that type of content. So if it took him four. Uh, that tutorial might've been a little boring. Like it was, it was twice as long as it needed to be. If it took him eight, it would have been really boring. So, um, we've also discovered, you can look at my friend, Lewis house. He's doing compilations of some of his guests all talking about the latest health trends, all talking about business tips or like mindset principles. A lot of the videos on his channel now are an hour, hour and a half, two hours, uh, three hours, sometimes four hours. And that might sound shocking. But it's about understanding who who you're talking to. Do people want to turn on? It's a lot of education, fascinating interviews with people. A four hour video might be something someone while they're just working in their shop or or working throughout the day likes to play in the background or they have long commutes. So they like to just turn it on and listen to it or they like to listen to it when they're walking. That is much more about the audience dictating the length of the content. That is much more about the value and intent you're putting to it, dictating the long uh, length of content. And so I hope some of those thoughts help people kind of shape their strategy. The answer ultimately is all of them. And YouTube has proved that all of the video lengths can be successful if it is as long as it needs to be, but as short as possible, if the viewer gets value, um, you know, again, a two hour tutorial on a video editing software is not going to go viral like a 30 second, really cute cat clip, but it's two different intents, two entirely different audiences and thus understanding your overall strategy of your channel and understanding sometimes people, you know, our education content gets less views than entertainment content, but education content also commands 10, 20, 30, a hundred times higher CPMs, um, which, which is from a business perspective, what that means is how much you earn from ad revenue. So someone could go, I got viral video, 10 million views on this funny dance I did. Whereas somebody in finance or tech could do a long form educational video and make four times the money that video earned because the audience watching is more valuable in terms of advertisers um, because they want to get in front of professionals who want professional content and who want real depth and real education and maybe have bigger purchase purchasing power. So that's a lot of factors that I would say that goes into it. I'm not going to give an answer because the answer is all of them. And I actually like that your study revealed that. Yeah, well, I, I love that because we we're, we say that often here, long as, long as needed, short as possible, 
we're big fans of that concept. And I, and I love your perspective on this because it is so easy to focus like, oh, it needs to be in this range. Well, no, make it, make the right length of video for the right purpose. So, well, Sean, this has been fantastic. We're gonna, we're gonna jump into our speed round questions. The idea of these is if you've never watched the show or your first time listening, we're gonna, these are meant to be quick, fast. We want you to answer, you know, nothing, more than 30 seconds to 60 seconds at the longest per question. So let's go into our speed round. All right, Sean, here we go. What's, what's one question you're asked about YouTube that you have to answer just all the time? What camera should I buy? Which camera should I buy? And, and in 60 seconds or less, what's the best answer to that question? Um, if it's just one camera or two cameras, first start with the phone you already have because you already have it. Punch perfectionism in the face and press record. Second, it's the Sony ZV-E10. It, it, it literally, Sony, I think, has cracked the code on making the perfect. Nothing is perfect for everybody, but this camera gets super close and it's great for live streaming, photography even, vlogging, professional content. They put a lot in a pretty affordable package. It's coming in right around $800. And what was the model again, just so we got it clear? It's a horrible model name, very hard to replicate. So Sony ZV-E10. And so that's, <laughs> it's ZV-E10. Okay, awesome. Next question. If you weren't growing a successful YouTube channel media company, what would Sean Cannell be doing? Um, I'd be snowboarding, I suppose, if I could <laughs> just afford it and there was money somewhere. Uh, I'd be hanging out with my one-year-old Sean Bradley, uh, and my wife, and uh, I'd probably be um, studying leadership and uh, sharing thoughts on business and leadership in some other way of creating content. Oh, awesome. Uh, question, teleprompter or no teleprompter when you make content? Uh, no teleprompter nine out of 10 times when you make content, but always teleprompter when you make a sales video when you make a professional video, maybe when you make an explainer video where kind of every word matters and every minute matters, when you make an ad, potentially, when you make a, a Facebook ad, an Instagram ad, a YouTube ad. Um, and, and, and that's also because if you're just like a sales letter or sales page, copy matters, the art of writing persuasive marketing copy like email copy or email subject lines. So if every word matters in the video, teleprompter for sure. But I would encourage most people to lean on outlines but not scripts bullet points but not scripts and build out that skill of uh extemporaneously talking teaching and communicating around an outline yeah i think there's a whole bunch of people in our audience just said what text man you tell us to write scripts but we have good reasons why but i agree with you i, I agree that most of the time you can you don't need a script unless you're doing those things that really require a script right there's and there's that 100 percent. sean where do you turn for inspiration uh Number one, the Bible. Um, number two, YouTube. <laughs> and, and no, and, well, that is the first one's in order. Uh, YouTube, definitely for inspiration. Nature, uh, number three. Um, uh, just getting out. I turn to running uh, because it gets your brain firing and blood flowing and ideas in unique places. Every time I, I go to a city and I'm kind of back on the circuit again, um, I like to block time to run throughout the city because it's a cool way to see things. And so I always get inspired uh, reading. Uh, I, I turn for inspiration. Um, I do. I think you should create more than you consume. But I also think that you should consume strategically. A lot of the great writers said all the great writers would say they were also passionate readers. Mm -hmm. So if you're a, a film movies, uh, you know, and, and other YouTube creators, because in adjacent industries, it's what you can study those in your own industry, but where it really gets interesting is when you study and then adjacent new media content formats, man, I'm, I'm, I'm crazy. And I, you know, I'm landing the plane map, but like, I mean, we just, at one point we had direct TV and we shut it down, you know, it was like 180 bucks, but now I look at, at our, whatever we're doing and I'm like, okay, we have HBO max, Amazon prime, Netflix. We have Disney Plus, we have Peacock, we have Hulu with no ads. Plus, we have like three or four things inside of Amazon stars. And, and it's probably because there was one thing we wanted to watch and we just haven't gone back to cancel. So I, I don't know. I, right now, we are depleting my son's college fund just to pay our media <laughs> bill. I mean, I've got YouTube premium as well. So it's like 
literally it's $17,898 a month for us. I'm obviously I'm joking, but like, um, but, but truly that I believe is also not only just passion and entertainment, but it's an investment in, um, just the new media landscape and studying yeah. like what's happening, uh, learning and being inspired. Awesome. So last question for you, Sean, this one, uh, inevitably we get told this is the hardest question. We don't mean it to be hard, but it's, it's not meant to be. So the last question for you is what's a question you'd like to ask me? I asked you all these questions today. I always like to give our guests a chance to turn around and see if there's anything they, they want to know or ask. What is YouTube meant to you or done for you, Matt? You know, that's an interesting question. So uh, I do not consider myself a YouTuber per se, but what I think I've, I, it's done for me is it's opened up an opportunity to, to really connect with people because I've been very fortunate in this role to, you know, meet people like yourself. We had uh, Nick Nimmin on recently, you know, Owen, uh, Owen Video or Owen Hemsath. I mean, we've just met so many great people. So for me, it's, I love seeing that. But the other thing is it's become, you know, I'm a, I'm an a learning designer. I create instructional stuff material. That's my background. That's what I have a, that's what this, one of these degrees on the wall is for, because I paid a lot of money to get credentialed to do that. Right. And I love that for me, YouTube has become a marketplace of learning. And it's, I think it's pushing my industry of learning professionals to have to really think hard about what we're doing because there's a lot of kind of set like guidelines, rules and things that you should do. And then people like you come along, Sean, and in and, and the best possible way, you say, I'm not a learning person, but I'm going to teach people. I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to be an educator. I'm going to be an instructor. I'm going to be a coach. And you're doing it so well. And it's forcing my people, my, you know, instructional designers, trainers, learning developers to really think about what we're doing and force us to really push to make better content, better media, because, because really smart people have come along and are doing it really well and you don't have the formal background and it's okay. So now I get to, I get to benefit and grow from that. Wow. It's inspiring answer. And I, and I love that too. There's so many positives of YouTube, but man, the community, like the learning, you know, the education and, and you're just, we're a part of a bigger movement. And I think about friends, relationships, connections, we're hanging out in Dallas. You know, mm -hmm. now we're connected again and these, and, and I think about Nick, I know Nick and Owen are also good friends and, and YouTube though, has been the vehicle. I mean, otherwise we probably wouldn't be in each other's lives, but like year after year, we're walking together. Of course, what Owen was going through recently or is still going through in terms of his health and, uh, Daryl and Nick and people gathering to raise money, like it's stunning the community and family and love and, and the bigger thing. I mean, the thing we're a part of is bigger than the part we play. And so that's inspiring to hear you say that, uh, Matt. And that was, I love that answer. Yeah. Well, well, Sean, thank you so much for all that you've shared with us today. And, and, uh, I'm grateful that I get to be a small part of your community. Uh, and, and as a fan, as a viewer is also just someone who would, you know, admires your, your faith and your dedication over this, this last, journey of 12, 15 years. It's been, it's been fantastic to watch. So thank you again for joining us on the visual lounge. You're welcome back anytime. We'd love to, to continue. Uh, there's so many questions I didn't even get to so many more we could ask, but so yeah, thanks let's do for it again someday, Matt. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. So thanks to everybody who tuned in today. Hopefully you got some great inspiration, got some ideas out of this and you can take these and do what we tell you to do every single week, which is to level up your skills and abilities, whether you're making videos, images, you're, you're using Camtasia or some other product, I don't even care. Just work, put in the time, be patient, but keep getting better every single day. We will see you guys next week with another fantastic guest. Thank you all. We'll see you next time.